October 24th, and the Texas Rangers are headed to the World Series. We're going to recap that game, and we're also going to recap game six of the NLCS. The Diamondbacks getting a 5-1 to one win, and then we're going to preview game seven, the two best words in sports. That's Jack McMullen. I'm Peter Apple. And it is all brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sports books. Use promo code Just Baseball when you sign up and deposit into your newly created account. Download the BetMGM Sports app on iOS or Android, or visit betmgm.com. Place your first bet, offer, and receive up to fifteen hundred dollars back in bonus bets if it loses. If the bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once the wager is settled. Gambling problem? Call or text one eight hundred Gambler. Must be twenty one or older terms and conditions apply jack i got my google doc up we're gonna go through my stream of consciousness and remember i have some takes on there that aren't necessarily good they are just things that i threw on to my google doc yeah and we love that about you um what i have to say off the top is i've got to stop pretending that i know ball me too. Because, like, I went into today, I went into yesterday, Monday, fully expecting the two opposite outcomes. Me I too. was thinking that Scherzer was going to get dogged and Javier was going to be amazing and the Astros were going to cruise to another World Series and the repeat bid was going to be fully on. I was also expecting the NLCS not to go to a Game 7. I was like, okay, Merrill Kelly in Philly again. It was a mutilation. This starting pitching matchup in that same venue was a 10 nothing win for the Phillies the first time i would th- i wasn't thinking 10 nothing i was thinking maybe 4-1 5-1 not the case i have to stop pretending i'm a casual i admit it i don't know ball i admit it and this is my two weeks well i might have to turn to my two weeks too because not only did i agree with you i also put my hard earned money on it Friends of BetMGM, I used the promo code and donated it all right back. I was on the Astros through the first five. That didn't hit, if I'm pretty sure. And I was on the Phillies money line with the same game parlay with Trey Turner to just get a hit. And did he, Jack? No, he didn't. I don't think he got a hit, no. No, no, he didn't. Bryce Harper didn't either. Kyle Schwarber? Nope. Nick Castellanos? Nope. We're going to talk about Diamondbacks versus phillies at the end right because then we'll do we'll do a recap then we'll do a preview of game seven let's celebrate the texas rangers the texas rangers people are headed to the world series john morosi tweeted out it's been over 4300 days since their last world series game they lost 94 games in 2022 and now You only got to win four more to win the World Series. Bruce Bochy was the perfect hire, and we have to get that out of the way right away. And they spent a lot of time on the Chris Young, Bruce Bochy dynamic on a Fox telecast during the final couple innings, and Bochy was still active. They said he was managing Team France in the World Baseball Classic qualifiers. If you're managing France in a WBC That means you still have the itch. I understand like coming out of retirement for Venezuela or the DR or, you know, somebody that's going to go deep. But France, you want to manage still. And this guy's obviously a Hall of Famer. I thought Smoltz nailed it. The the only thing that Bochy did by coming out of quote unquote retirement was delay his Hall of Fame induction. And at this point, Bruce Bochy, if I have the numbers correct, and I'm I'm 99% sure I do has won 15 of the last 16 postseason series that he has managed. 15 of 16. Three World Series with the Giants. There was a first-round exit. And now, in his first appearance back since he won that World Series in 14, he's got his team winning a wild card, winning a DS, and winning a CS. So if my math is adding up, that's 15 of 16 postseason series for a Hall of Fame manager in Bruce Bochy. Just to add on top of that, he's never lost a game seven either. Four and, and oh Dusty, in game sevens. And Dusty has lost seven in a row. In elimination. Elimination. Elimination games. 
So not game sevens, but I think in an elimination game, a Dusty Baker managed team has lost the last seven. Well, that doesn't make sense because they won the World Series, I guess. But no elimination game. No elimination games. That's always the classic, like Michael Jordan has never been to a game seven or or that narrative. And then it's like, well, he was winning them in six. Yeah, like he didn't need to get to game seven. Game seven means you failed three times. <laughs> and like Jordan didn't do that. Let's get into the game. So again, I wrote these all all these thoughts down on my Google Doc and we'll react to them. So first inning, instant offense by the Rangers. And I wrote down they figured out the fastball. And there was a bunch of people who broke it down, but Basically, it looks like they were just getting on top of it, right? The first time they faced Christian Javier, 70% fastball usage up in the zone. They really didn't have a prayer. Their only offense was a fifth inning two-run home run by Josh Young on a hanging slider. In this game, instantly they were on top of it. Top hand on top and driving the baseball. And when you take out Christian Javier's fastball, He doesn't have that many other pitches to go to, especially because the Texas Rangers were the best team in Major League Baseball against sliders. So they figured out and but to give them a lot of credit, though, a lot of teams know that. Right. Christian Javier came into the playoffs with a two point zero eight. ERA. He had thrown 11 innings this postseason at a one six nine that two oh eight ERA in 43 innings. That's better than any pitcher that we have in the postseason, right? Zach Wheeler accumulated more innings, but Javier was the shutdown guy. We were witnessing, before we got into this game, a guy who didn't care about the bright lights, a guy who threw a combined no-hitter when the Astros were down 2-1 to one against the Phillies. But in this game, the Texas Rangers offensive juggernaut took control. They made the adjustment, which a lot of other teams can't make. So it sounds easy, right? Just get on top of his fastball. Nobody else could do it in his 43 innings except for the Texas Rangers. And that's just been the story of this offense. You can get him once. You can't get him twice. Yeah. Javier, it was kind of weird from the jump because it was – I don't even think it was a different Javier. I think they just went in with a plan of attack. And he is one of the very few guys where you can know what's coming and you just can't deal with it. And there are, I'm trying to think like fastball oriented guys that do that. Like there are some guys breaking pitches. Like when Scherzer was on Scherzer's slider during his Nats days, like you could know it's coming and you're not touching it. Moe's cutter, obviously Rivera's cutter out of the pen, but very few guys fastballs. And I'm thinking, Hall of Famers, like, okay, there are Hall of Fame fastballs where you can't do anything about it. And in the game right now, I think Strider's fastball falls into that category. Like, there are days where you just won't touch his fastball. But the Rangers, for them to make that tangible adjustment against Javier's fastball, I don't know. Like, there are $15,000 pitching machines that will spit out, like, high IVB fastballs to them. I... I, it's almost a matter of time before they get to a fastball dependent pitcher, but the Rangers are just that good. And the swing that did it for me was literally right away. And it was Corey Seager with the ump cam. The ump cam is awesome. Awesome. The ump cam was best used in that situation. A for the aesthetic beauty of the ball flying off his bat to right center. Seeing that was a work of art, but also seeing how he managed to get to that upstairs heater. I was like, okay, this guy knew exactly what was coming and he didn't miss it. And that was the beginning of the end for Christian Javier. It was the beginning of the end. He only recorded a couple of outs before he got yanked immediately. But it was so funny, too, because I was looking and I was like, well, Christian Javier looks like he's throwing hard. Is there something off with him? Right? Framber Valdez against the Rangers. Velocity on that on that sinker was down curveball spin rate all down so it's like all right didn't have it that day javier's fastball velocity was up 1.2 miles an hour from average his slider velocity up 1.6 javier had given up two hits on a hundred fastballs thrown this postseason he gave up three against the rangers throwing it 15 times that was reported on the broadcast i think by verducci But regardless, what an amazing stat. So 
there's nothing really here to blame Javier for in terms of, oh, he just didn't have it that day. You know, the Rangers got him, you know, on a tough stretch. No, no, no. He had his full stuff. And and that's what I wanted to make clear, too, is that nobody has been able to just to adjust against Christian Javier in the playoffs, except for the Rangers. So it's easy. It's way easier said than done. And for the fact that they just got on him like that, I mean, the game was over at that point, Jack. Yeah. Um, by the way, 12 of his last 13 postseason series, that's the Bruce Bochy number. It, for some reason, I just couldn't add. And I was like, four, no, three, 12 of 13, I do believe is the correct number. But yeah, man, I mean, they just jumped on him. And I I don't know how I would handle the bullpen if I was Dusty Baker, but <laughs> there's something Didn't about matter. Phil Maton. Phil Maton is like r- a really good reliever. Whenever I see him warming up at the pen, I'm like, you don't look like you want to go in the game. He's got he's got this baby face look, but like there's something about just the way he gazes. And I'm like, do you want to be pitching right now? Like, do you want to be here? I'm not sure. Love it. I love watching you pitch, Phil Maton. I'm just making an observation. But going it's- to Maton and then JP France. B- before we get to France, yeah. I did write down on my Google Doc. Uh, Phil Maton, after he recorded the last out, just wanted to go home. So funny, dude is so done with this game. Like, did you yeah. when he got that out? It's like, all right, you just you just stopped a, what could have been a potential horrible inning into a bad inning, right? Did, yeah, but- it, it was just like for all those watching on YouTube, he was like. Yeah, here's the thing, though. Facially, he's always like that. Just blank stare. He was like that in game six. Like any high leverage moment that calls for Phil Maton, he looks exactly like that. There's something about the gaze that I'm just like, (laughs) do you want to be a baseball player? He wanted to go home, dude. That was not his spot. He was not expected to come with the first inning. He's doing not mop up duty, but he's like, fuck this. What the the Rangers are going to win anyway. What are we doing here? So let's let's keep moving down the line. Um, I just wanted to mention Corey Seager. I just said Ridiculous. that he. I wrote down Corey Seager is on one death beam pointed at the United States. Give me Corey Seager, and then I followed that up. Wait, death beam might be Adolis Garcia, and then I wrote down. Wait a minute, back on Seager. I just kept going back and forth with the death beam on both of them in my Google Doc. Well, that is probably in honor of Andre Iguodala retiring and signing his deal with ESPN. Yep. Right? Like, we the Martians have the death beam. Give me Jordan Alvarez. Give me Bryce Harper. Give me Andre Iguodala. No, give me Adolis and Corey Seager. That works for me. Corey Seager's just on one, man. I mean, this is the 2020 World Series MVP. I think in the discussion of best hitters in baseball, he kind of gets lost in the scuffle, right? All we talk about is Bryce Harper. All we talk about is Jordan Alvarez, and deservedly so. But Corey Seager, if there was no Shohei Otani in the American League, would have won the MVP this season. And then has just stayed hot in the postseason. There was a couple of games there where he slid a little bit and then just bounced all the way back. So if you're getting a hot Corey Seager going into the World Series, you are in an incredible spot because, of course, you got Adolis. And that's what makes the Rangers so good is they have so many fantastic bats they did this this entire series without much from marcus Semyon. no right next to nothing basically next to nothing imagine if he gets hot now they have so many professional incredible hitters that they only need three or four of them hot at a given time because when josh young and leody Tavares at the bottom of your lineup are hitting how about travis jankowski like, shout out Travis Jankowski just coming in and getting a base knock. Like, he, he I would take Travis yeah, Jankowski over any bench bat Major League Baseball right now. He could be a starter. <laughs> this offense is just overwhelming. And it starts with Seager, and it starts with the Dolies. And if Marcus Semien has a great World Series run, this series is going to be over in five because they're just going to hit too much. Well, to tie a bow on the Seager point, he had it in the wild card series, and then he didn't at the end of the DS and the beginning of the CS, to be honest. And now he's got it again. So he's ridden like he's been on the suspension bridge so far this postseason. And here's to hoping it's not a roller coaster. And he just continues to climb up because if he replicates what he did the last couple of games in the world series, if you get anything from Marcus Semien, it's probably good night moon, regardless of who comes out on the national league side, because yes, Leo Tavares, yes, Josh Young. How about Evan Carter, man? Like, how about 
Mitch Garver and Jonah Hine taking them through game six. How about all of them? How about just literally all of them? Like I'm mentioning other guys. Hate? I'm mentioning other guys just to mention them, but you're I'm you're right. How about Evan Carter? How about Jonah Hine? How about all of them? They're all amazing. Also, like what Garver took 98 on the rib cage from Brian Abreu. Just and then it. and then Chaz McCormick took 104 on the back of his knee. From foolish baseball, when Chas McCormick got hit by 104 from Aroldis Chapman, first of all, I wrote down that would kill me. The fact that he got up is the best thing the Astros did. So here's here's what I think would happen. I think that my entire leg, and I'm blanking on the bone, and like it sucks because I'm at my girlfriend's apartment and she's in med school and she would absolutely tell me like femur, girlfriend girlfriend flex flex. for for sure. And it's a femur. Femur. Yeah, I think it's femur. You don't need her. You got me. You got me. Got you. Um, I think my femur would actually dissolve into a fine powder and then just blow away in the wind. I would go to the hospital and they would have to wake me out of a coma. And they'd be like, Peter, you're not in a coma. You just got hit on the leg. I wouldn't wake up for at least a year. Yeah. No, I'm <laughs> I'm out. I would nope. view that as like a good excuse to take a nap, though. <laughs> just like, yeah, I need I need to kind of chill for a minute. I, I like, need a break. I mean, yeah. this, that was way too much. <laughs> so that was the second highest hit by pitch since 2008 in the pitch tracking era, trailing only Jordan Hicks with a 104.3 when he hit A.J. Pollock back in 2018. And what I will say is every other one of his pitches was 101, right? That was the highest pitch that he threw that day. 103.7 straight at him. No, that was, you know what that was? That was speed pitch. That was like, I'm a couple beers deep. I'm at the center field concourse and it's We're time for me to set a record. We're up eight. Fuck it. I'm drilling you. And I know that sounds bad, what I just said, but I do think he drilled him on purpose. And I you know what? It's no, okay. No, 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 he no. might have. And it's no. okay. No, <laughs> no, no. Why I mean, that was, McCormick? I know, but it was two and a half mile an hour. There are nine, right no, at him. No, no, no. There are nine mm-hmm. guys in the batting order. I think Chaz McCormick is the 12th guy that I would hit. It's a good point. There's, there was no, no reason. reason. There was no reason to do it. Just like Brian Abreu, when he hit Adolis Garcia, there was reason to do it. I still don't think it was intentional. No. I just know Chapman well, and I feel like he was looking for a lick. Because why did it, that go two and a half miles an hour faster than his other fastest pitch straight no. at him? I'm That's what you, I thought it was, it was initially. A speed pitch thing. It was like, oh, now's the time for me to like really uncork. Okay, so I wrote it down on my Google Doc, and it's one of these takes that I don't delete anything. It is straight from the dome, and I write it down, and I talk about it on the show. I did write down Chapman definitely just hit Chaz McCorbick on purpose. No, comma I respect it. I did nope. write that down. I don't stand by it, but I did write it down technically. Bro, so that was a thought in my mind. I think this is a great opportunity to learn how to use the backspace <laughs> key on your keyboard. I don't do that. These are my thoughts, whether Man, they're true or not. Sharpie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least I, yeah, I would it. delete that if I were you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, producer, can you delete that from the uh, from the podcast? Got you. Please? Got um, you, man. So a couple other things. You know how I always do the game was over at this point. I continually do that where I just say based on momentum. That is a pivotal point in the game. And if it doesn't go that team's way, it's probably over. Can I guess? Tell me. Yeah, go ahead and guess. Uh, When Dusty Baker made the move to JP France. Well, yes, I have something about JP France later, but it was the Michael Brantley double play, right? It's 3-0, Astro score run, and you're like, holy shit, this is just going to be one of those 10-8 games, right? Astros are getting that momentum back. Max Scherzer getting that double play on Michael Brantley to strand runners on first and third. I was like, that was why you traded for Scherzer. And I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but it was just like, that was a big balls pitch to a guy who did struggle this postseason overall, right? Hit under 200. But at the same time, if Brantley gets a hit there, the Astros could have won this game, right? You drive in another run. It's a one-run game. Bullpens are managed differently, right? But you get him there, and that just took the crowd out of it. And once they officially kind of took the crowd out of it, that's when I felt like the game was over. And then it was mega over when J.P. France entered. 
So it, there were two points where I thought the game was over. And like the concrete one was Nathaniel Lowe, again, just beyond the reach of Kyle Tucker in right field. Like that guy couldn't catch a break all <laughs> postseason long. I feel terrible for Kyle Tucker. Do you? I do like, and listen, when he signs his $300 million deal, I'm not going to feel bad. That's why like, I don't feel bad. I know he's going to get the biggest bag in the, in no, one he's of He's going to wipe his tears bags. with a couple of Benjamins and we're going to call it a day. He's been to like a bunch of world series. He's been to a bunch of ALCSs. Like you had a shit postseason. It happens. He's still one of the great players in our game. Um, And I did say, I did write down again, these are just thoughts. Oh, you got to start deleting. <laughs> I wrote down, are we sure Kyle Tucker deserves $100 million in his next contract? Yes. Yes. I think he deserves 3x that. But no, like if you think that the Yankees need Kyle Tucker on a two-year $25 million deal and it's Approve a club it option for year Approve two. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I understand where you're coming from, but let me just like smack some sense into you. <laughs> okay. Um, now, so I think Nathaniel Lowe leaving just over Kyle Tucker was like the concrete point. But for me, the emotional point that I thought the game was over was when Gumby came into the game. Montgomery on short rest. He threw, what, 82 pitches on Friday? And here he is serving as a bridge man in game seven on Monday? That guy's a star. That was like the head of the mafia bringing in their hitman. <laughs> I mean, that's what it felt like. I wrote down what a gangster move by Bruce Bochy. He took out Scherzer. Then I see Jaymont walking in and I audibly gasped. So gangster gets an immediate line out. Like that is the same move that won these Giants teams, the World Series. You know who we're going to go to? Jordan Montgomery. Because I was thinking to myself, Jack, if, if Bruce Bochy brings in Cody Bradford, they are going to lose the game. But they bring in Jaymont, and he's just such a beast. And then I wrote down, I'd give Jordan Montgomery three hundred million. <laughs> so what you're doing right now is is you're swapping the value of Jordan Montgomery and Kyle Tucker. And you have to. I you respect have to. it. Yeah, I respect it. it. This is a what have you done for me lately game? Exactly. And the sample proves that Jordan Montgomery's probably three times the player that Kyle Tucker is. At least, because I did say, are we sure we want to give Kyle Tucker $100 million? I wasn't sure. And I'm sure that I'd give Jordan Montgomery $300 million. You know who needs a guy like that? The Yankees should look into Jordan <laughs> Montgomery's services. Uh, did you see that, speaking of the Bochi thing and turning to a couple starters, did you see the Buster only tweet that Madison Baumgartner texted Bochi this morning and was like, I'm ready to pitch if need be? <laughs> I, and I saw that, and I was like, I think he could pitch well. It, I didn't know yes. he's been horrible, but I feel like he could get six outs, Here's two the hits, thing. no runs. Here's the thing. Ton of respect, and Giants Madison Bumgarner was one of my favorite pitchers. But, like, if he was three years removed from his final inning, I would probably think the joke landed a little bit more. But, like, <laughs> he got DFA this year. So he he could be like, I, I could do that right now. And no, you can't. But some guys are just built for the bright moments. And the guy that we have to continue to shower praise on, and I love Corey Seager. Love him to death. Love the entire Rangers offense. Love the starting pitchers. The bullpen stepped up. But Adolis Garcia is your ALCS MVP. Adolis Garcia hit a home run in four straight games. Five home runs to be exact. He joined a group of only hitting or of hitting multiple home runs in game sevens. Yogi Berra, Jason Giambi, Adolis Garcia. The most RBIs in an ALCS ever with 19. And yeah, he pimped a single. Who cares? Dude earned it. I even wrote that down. I said that was hilarious that he pimped that and only got to first base, but then he stole a bag to make up for it and arm put it perfectly. He's electric. Adolis Garcia. This guy. <laughs> and did you see the back and forth uh, between Passan and those writers about the Cardinals getting shit for DFAing him? And no. then two years later, so the Cardinals DFA'd him in 2019. 
26 year old outfielder, then goes to the Texas Rangers. Two years later, goes the, back Ran- the, the Rangers, Rangers DFA him, and no team claimed him. So then he returns back to the Rangers and is a postseason hero. It's an incredible story. He's amazing. He's carved out of granite. Like that guy looks different in a baseball uniform than the other guys that were on the field. Jordan Alvarez in a different way, but Adolis Garcia is like, wow, man, like you've done P90X every day for your entire life, huh? And he's he's special, man, and he hits the ball so ferociously hard. And we talked about it a little bit on yesterday's show. One of the notes that I had when he was 0 for 4 with four punch outs in game six was – Adolis Garcia has never been a villain before, and it's pretty clear because he was the villain going into Houston in game six. And what does he do? His first four plate appearances, he punches out. But here's the thing about an ALCS MVP or a series MVP. They can have a shit game until the eighth inning, until the ninth inning. And this turns on a dime. So a grand slam wipes away your golden sombrero day. And game seven was the cherry on top of an already delicious cake, but he put like some great icing on it too in game seven. 19 RBIs is hard to wrap my brain around. Yeah, I don't think a Sunday is a good enough term for him. It's like if you sprinkle like some cocaine on top of that Sunday, just freaking electric. I wouldn't you know. know. Just... I'm not sure how you would know. Yeah, me neither. Um, <laughs> let's talk about Josh Spores. Let's talk about Josh Spores for a second. What was our gripe with the Rangers, right? If there was any holes, it was their bullpen, right? We knew Evaldi would be great. We knew Jordan Montgomery would be great. We assumed that Scherzer would fill some sort of role. We knew the offense would be amazing, and we knew that the manager would be great. But a couple of guys stepped up, notably yeah. Jose LeClerc in that closer role. But Josh Spores in the playoffs, eight and two-thirds, two hits, one earned run, seven strikeouts. For Josh Spores, their seventh inning guy. Unbelievable. And that only earned run was because he left a runner on third after he gave up his second hit in that span. So going into that game, seven innings in relief, one hit, no earned, seven strikeouts. Yeah. He goes one and two thirds against the Astros in that game. Now, not a lot of pressure on him but there's been pressure on him all series long. Like the Rangers have found a legit seventh inning guy to go along with Chapman and LeClerc. And what I will say is I have much more faith in spores than I do Chapman in a big spot. Now, if you're up eight, Chapman looks like the best reliever of all time, but I don't know how often you're going to be up eight. And you might be right. They seem like they're up eight every playoff series. So why wouldn't they? Right. Like I, I would say not often, but I, I don't know. Small to put it best, expect the unexpected with this series. And I just consistently expected what was expected. And I got burnt left and right. Adolis, by the way, 15 RBIs in the league championship series, 20 overall this postseason. So he's just ridiculous. OPS right around 1300 in this seven game LCS. Um, Yeah. Spores. What I will say about seventh inning guys is they are the most overlooked players in baseball they are the left guard of baseball we're like you know obviously the offensive line you you want to talk about you know how underappreciated those guys are i think bullpen arms go underappreciated all the time but you know the closer is the left tackle like left tackles sign massive contracts the setup guy is the center you need a good center and if you don't have one it's pretty obvious But if you have a good left guard, that opens up the inside running game. Like you can run between the tackles with a good left guard. I mean, and that's what a seventh inning guy does. Shortening the game from seven to six innings is something you don't think about until you get here. And they found it. Quick football reference 49ers lost on Monday Night Football to the Minnesota Vikings. They were missing Trent Williams, left tackle. Left tackle. So, and just a closer. Exactly. Just, but. I think we we understand the point where the offensive line in the NFL often goes underrated, these key bullpen arms. And for example, his opponent, right? Who's his who's his guy that he's going up against, right? If they if the Rangers and the Astros all line up 
on opposite oh, lines. Oh, like who are you comparing him to? Who are you Neris? comparing? Hector You're Neris, comparing right? Neris. Hector Neris had a seven seven one ERA in the postseason. That was his competition. So Josh Sports could go and lay his head on the pillow, being like, "My guy was Hector Neris. I beat I him in our one on one matchup. I beat him in my one on one." And Josh Spores yeah. has been beating every seventh inning guy in his one on one in these playoffs. A yeah. couple of Astros notes. Uh, I wrote down Jordan really just tripled on a breaking ball at his feet. No words for that man. Put Crazy. him in the Hall of Fame tomorrow. Crazy. He's, Crazy. he's an alien life form. Jose Altuve, another sneaky, amazing postseason within two home runs of Manny Ramirez for the most postseason home runs of all time. He's at 27. Manny's got 29. Pretty sure we're going to see Altuve in the playoffs once again. He's going to hold every record. Jose Altuve is going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer, folks. Just put it in your mind. He's an all-time postseason great. Him in the box next to Jonah Heim, who's a big catcher, is hilarious. And he's one of a kind, man. Like, he he's one of a kind. And it was a pretty funny bottom of the ninth where, like, you know, you got, what, an eight-run game, a nine-run game, and the first pitch from Leclerc in the ninth inning is just lift off down the left field line it was oh there's Altuve's 27th momentous occasion but you're down by a ton anything else on this series um we'll talk about the Rangers in a minute I guess to just wrap up on my point um I'm very upset with myself I got bullied into taking the Astros to win in seven this entire time what was I saying the Astros or the Rangers are the best team when they are hot and they got hot at the right time I picked them in every series, uh, except the Rays. I did pick the Rays to win the World Series. But once the Rangers got past the Rays, picked the Rangers over the Orioles, then I sat here thinking, I keep picking against the Astros in the playoffs. What am I doing? They are inevitable. And I picked the Astros in seven, and I was freaking wrong. But I was kind of right. So I'm going to give myself a pat on the back there and say, you know what I meant when I picked Astros in seven. Is that fair? Can I give myself a half star? No, but it's always important to give yourself pats on the back. Whenever always. you can see like a back road to that pat on the back, just do it whenever. It's tough when you're as wrong as you and I are. Yeah. No, I um, know. Let's talk. Um, oh, and by the way, the Rangers are my pick to win the World Series, regardless of who comes out of Game 7 of the NLCS. Yeah, we've seen flaws from Philly. So, I mean, we can save the World Series preview for Thursday if you want. But we will. Yeah, me too. Like, they're too hot. They're too hot. Um, and they have home field advantage, which is huge, especially over the Phillies. Let's talk about those Phillies. Five to one loss. Aaron Nola, four and a third, six hits, four earned runs. He allowed eight balls to be hit over 95 miles an hour. Aaron Nola has thrown 18 and two thirds innings in this postseason going into that game. 0-9-6 ERA, 1-7-0 FIP. He threw 44 and a thirds in his playoff career, 3-2-5 ERA. At home this year, pitched to a 3 2 ERA compared to a 5-4-3 ERA on the road. This was historically the best version of Aaron Nola. And what did the Diamondbacks do? They hit the living piss out of him. It clearly, all it took, they just needed to see him once. And I wrote in my article when I picked Philly's money line that Nola had too many pitches to adjust to a second time, right? When you're working with six pitches with the two-seamer riding in, he can go curveball first pitch or for the strikeout. He can go the two-seamer for the first pitch or for the strikeout. He could go to any pitch in his arsenal. So I had a hard time believing that in the bank, when the Phillies had a chance to close this out, I thought Aaron Nola would pitch really well. And we saw this in the last postseason. Started off really hot, then slowed down as the postseason went along. And I also wrote, Nola is not only motivated by team success to get his team to the World Series, he's also financially motivated that every single one of these starts, you can factor into contract negotiations because he is a free agent after this season. That is not a start he will want to remember when him and his agent go talk to teams this winter. For sure. Before we get to this NLDS, looks like Dusty Baker's done. Looks Whoa. like he might have just retired. So 74-year-old Dusty Baker, 26 years managing in the big leagues, over 2,100 wins, 2,183 wins 
He won a World Series in 22. He has three pennants to his name. He was a three-time manager of the year. So he managed the Giants for 10 years, the Reds for six, the Cubs for four, which is where I first fell in love with Dusty Baker, the Nats for two, and Houston for the last four. So tip of the cap to Dusty, man. That's crazy. But, like, I get it. When he was on his hiatus, I was out on the Cape. And his son, Darren, who's in AAA for the Nats now, was playing for Brewster, which is where I was calling games. And Darren was a late ad. That season, I think, started like early June, if I remember correctly. And it ran through about mid-August. I think it was a 44-day season, maybe mid-June. And mid-July rolls around, and Darren is like the latest show up. Darren comes... And I see a dude just in a folded out lawn chair eating a sandwich in like the opposing bullpen at two o'clock for a six o'clock game. I'm like, who is that? And then a couple of players walk over. It's like, that's Dusty Baker. So I went up, had a five minute conversation with him, my partner, Tim Leonard and, and me, and it was a blast. So super nice guy. Hopefully this is like just real retirement. And like, he does some advisor work in a baseball front office and, this guy, man, he's he's one of the all-time baseball greats, but uh, that's crazy. That's kind of a bomb that we got after Midnight Eastern. Absolute bomb, and I'm still gonna not going to officially count him out of returning. The fact that he said, I do want to return in some form to help a big league team, whether that's in the front office or in another role, Bruce Bochy also retired. Like These guys are legends of the game. It could be officially he's gone, which would stink. For baseball, he makes baseball better as a person, as a manager. So I hope he comes back. Hope he reconsiders this right after a loss. But shout out Dusty Baker. And we'll talk more about him on on future episodes. Uh, but let's get back to Diamondbacks yeah, versus Phillies. Your NOLA point. I'll, I'll run with your NOLA point if you don't mind. But NOLA, yes, it's a start-by-start -start thing. He's making more and more money. And I think he just took a step backwards in that money conversation, in that free agency conversation. But I don't think that this loss for the Phillies is as much of an indictment on NOLA's start as it is a testament to Arizona's offense and an indictment on Philly's offense. Where did it go? Like, they were home run city in Philly before this game, and they were dormant. Here was my overarching takeaway, and I don't want to take anything away from the units on the field, whether that be the offensive unit or the guys on the mound. I wasn't, when I was watching the game, I wasn't giving a ton of credit to the Diamondbacks offense because I thought Aaron Nola was just throwing fastballs middle-middle. Right, you would get a runner on, and he'd be looking over, and he would just throw a meatball down the middle. But then on the other side, I wasn't as down on the Phillies' offense. I actually gave a lot of credit to Merrill Kelly, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but that was my overarching takeaway. I thought the reason the Phillies lost was actually Aaron Nola not performing not exactly the Phillies offense. And then on the Diamondback side, I thought Merrill Kelly spun an incredible game. And I wasn't super impressed with the Diamondbacks just hitting these middle, middle 92 mile an hour fastballs. Agreed. But I don't, the Phillies got to put up more than a run, man. Like the Phillies need to show up offensively, especially when it's a non wheeler start. And if you learned anything from that three game stretch in Arizona, like you need to show up. You need to be present as long as it's a non wheeler start and Ranger. I've got a lot of confidence in Ranger. Ranger will wrap with that, but man, like, I don't know. We want to brand him as co aces. And to this point we could, but if they do win game seven, I feel way better about Wheeler starts than I do Nola starts. And I might want to cut it with the co-aces thing. And that's what I was saying. It wasn't like the Diamondbacks were hitting these low and away curveballs for base hits. And Nola was putting it where he wanted to. Yeah, but they were jumping on the right overcame. pitches. It was yeah. just middle. Like, I was like, yeah, if it's 92 in the zone like that, you're going to hit a bunch of 107-mile-an-hour hits, just like Tommy Pham did, just like Lordy Scoriel did, just like Evan Longoria hit. Now, 
they need some praise for doing what they should do to those type of pitches, right? It's one thing to get a good pitch to hit. It's another thing to send it 107 into the gap or 108 over the fence. But the player I really, really want to highlight here, because I didn't give him his flowers in that first start, because Aram said, you know, outside of a few mistakes, I thought Merrill Kelly pitched well. And I kind of disagreed because I was like, when you give up three home runs in a start, like, yeah, he didn't give up that many hits, right? Three home runs on three hits in game two. In game six, he also gave up three hits, but none of them were home runs. I just thought that he was so locked in. And when I finally came to that conclusion was early in the first inning, uncompetitive walk to Kyle Schwarber. And I was like, oh no, this is going to be a bloodbath. Then he gets Trey Turner to fly out, and Trey Turner has owned him, hitting 455 against him. So that was a big out. Didn't even pitch to Harper, and then got the next couple of outs. On one side, Kelly made incredible adjustments. The Phillies were jumping all over his four-seamer, attacking on the first pitch, just like they did with Gallon. So what did Kelly do? He made an adjustment, started going off-speed first, upped his sinker usage. Normally it's at 12%, upped it to 23%, right? Clear plan of attack against the Phillies. While the Phillies never adjusted, they weren't getting that same recipe that they saw in game two, and then they just folded. So instead of seeing 94-mile-an-hour four-seamers, they were seeing 93-mile-an-hour sinkers. He was on the black. I thought he was methodical. He preyed on a Phillies team that didn't seem to have a great approach up there. And he does what Merrill Kelly does. If you don't have a great approach against him, he is going to eat you alive. He is built on arguably, I know the walks are there, but it's hard not to say that this guy's some of the best command in major league baseball with multiple pitches, just kind of putting it wherever you want. And an over-aggressive team like the Phillies, when they fall into that Merrill Kelly trap, you wake up and it's the sixth inning. And he did exactly that. I thought he was fantastic. He faced 21 hitters. I thought he should have faced 27. That was pretty much about that as well. So Merrill Kelly walks into the dugout when Tori Lovello says, yep, you're done. Thank you. Handshake. Yeah. And Merrill Kelly, you can hear what he's saying, not exactly on audio, but you can definitely hear it. You know, if you read his lips. And he says, I just struck out the two best hitters in their lineup. What are we doing here? And Tori Lovello said, you know what? You're done. If I was Kelly, I would have been so pissed. So pissed. Multiple reasons. Looking forward to game seven. Hey, we're winning. I can keep going. I feel great. I'm the guy. I'm our stud. We have Gallon and we have me. And then Brandon Fodd is developing, but like, we're the guys. Let me get some run here. They can't hit me. It was really unfortunate. I thought Tori Lovello did not make a good decision because then he put in more bullpen arms than he needed to, right? Used all the key arms. Now, they'll be available in this game, but they would have been a little bit fresher. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really bad move. Thankfully, it didn't matter for this game, but it could prove to be the difference in game seven. There are four guys that I want to turn to in this bullpen in game seven. Like top four on my bullpen depth chart. Seawald is one. Ginkle is two. Thompson is three. Saul Frank is four. Yep. Guess which four they used? All of them. Every single one. And Ryan Thompson had to get four outs. And I get it. He did it in 15 pitches. Yeah, like they'll be okay. But the fact of the matter is... You didn't need to do that. I I I think what Tori Lavelle was doing is like, we need to get to game seven first, put in our best guys. Like we need to win now. And I get that, right? For sure. There is no tomorrow if you were to blow it. However, taking out Merrill Kelly there, I I, I don't know the reasoning because it's not like he's pitching tomorrow. We've had this conversation twice, all postseason. It just happens to be with the same team and the guy that starts tonight in game seven. I thought Fott got a premature yank, and now Kelly gets a premature yank, and it hasn't burned them yet. It's those decisions that 
just kind of stick around forever. Blake Snell sticks around forever. Jose Barrios in the wild card series. It's going to stick around for a minute. Obviously, it's not like a you know huge moment. It's not a CS or a World Series, but I'll remember that John Schneider pulled the plug on Barrios early. It's it's these kind of things that like they just stick with a fan base. It's like why didn't you go with Merrill Kelly? And listen, ninety nine point nine percent of it is forgiven when you win the ball game. Yeah, but if somebody looks rusty tomorrow, or if somebody looks you know like a little tired tomorrow. We're going to say, hey, you know, like Kelly probably could have given you five more hitters. Easily. I thought he could have gone a lot longer, right? Yeah. When Kelly exited the game, 90 pitches. Mm-hmm. Could have gone 110. Could have easily gotten you another inning. Why? I get Why it. Not? I, I get not rolling him out there at 90, but like let him get to 100. Have him give you two more outs. I think he can give you two more outs. I would have sent them out there for the entire sixth inning until stuff started to unravel. And maybe that's why I'm sitting in this chair right now talking on a podcast and not a major league manager. But I remember in the moment I said, there is no reason to take him out. Yeah. Well, let's go back to Nola for a second. And instead of beating up on Nola, I do want to give these Diamondbacks a lot of credit on offense. Because like I said, it's one thing for Nola not to be on his game. Nola not on his game can still be effective. And the Diamondbacks took full advantage, and they did it early. Cattell fucking Marte. And I keep saying, like, okay, calling him a superstar is not the right term, right? Because he's dealt with injuries on and off. But Cattell freaking Marte starts his postseason on a 15-game hit streak. The most all-time to start a career. Now, the longest hit streak in postseason history is held by three guys. Derek Jeter, Hank Bauer, who played with the Yankees in the 1950s, and Manny Ramirez with 17. Cattell Marte has 25 hits in his first 15 postseason games. Cattell Marte, if he gets a hit tomorrow, he's at 16. And then game one of the World Series, if they go there, he'll be at 17. This guy is not stopping. Righties, lefties, he's a switch hitter, right? He's facing Ranger tomorrow. He has a great matchup against Rangers for us again, right? That's He went three for four in that game. He's probably going to hit a home run. He is a wagon, Jack, a wagon. He is, I would say he's having an out-of-body experience, but he hasn't been attached to his body for the entire month, which is a hard thing to do. He's amazing, and he is not the only reason that the Diamondbacks are still in this, but you know he has kind of been the only really consistent performer in this Diamondbacks offense. Like Carroll has gone cold. Alec Thomas has gotten hot to be a Robin to Cattell Marte's Batman, but I was, Batman hasn't gone away. God, yeah, I was so wrong on Alec Thomas. Oh, shit. What did I say? I said if I could take his over one and a half ground outs to second base, I would. I mean, what an idiotic take. As soon as we get off the podcast, the next day it's a freaking dinger. And then ever since then, dude is amazing. Shout out Alec Thomas. Don't shout out Peter Apple. Alec Thomas, you win this round. Jack McMullen, you win this round. Arizona Diamondbacks, you win this round. The people of Phoenix win this round. And I snakes alive. Snakes alive. Alec Thomas beast. But let's keep going back to the Diamondbacks overall offense because Gabby Moreno has also been standing on his head. He's got an OPS over a thousand. Is hitting three seventy five. It's been awesome, and he has been arm brought it up too. He's been getting battered physically, like he he got trucked by Bryce Harper. There was nothing that Bryce could do about it, but he got trucked, and like he's still here and being a three hitter. When the first time he did that was this postseason, come on now, he's a star and he's a top ten catcher in baseball. And the backswing. Right. Trey Turner has a backswing. Luckily, it hit him in the face mask, but that was almost another one. Dude, just getting clocked in the head. And the reason why he's such a stud is that it keeps getting clocked in the head and then immediately getting a base hit. Right. Gets trucked by Bryce Harper in game five. His next AB against Zach Wheeler, base hit up the middle. The only guys who are really feeding this offense could tell Marte and Gabby Moreno. 
in Thomas. I mean, and Thomas, but I mean, Thomas does have an 891 OPS this this playoff. So yeah, absolutely Alec Thomas. But it does seem like when Cattell Marte and Gabby Moreno come into the lineup, like they're going to get the hits. And it was good to finally see Tommy Pham break out of something with that home run and Lordy Scurriel sure. Jr. too. Like they're four, five, six guys, 736 OPS for Walker, 635 for Tommy Pham, 676 for Lordy Scurriel Jr. All three of them are hitting below 235. And then you got Longoria back there hitting 147, but he had the nice double. Hopefully that kickstarts something. And of course, just like we always do, forgetting Geraldo Perdomo, who's also all stars. I don't forget. I don't forget all stars. And you shouldn't. 766 OPS just doing his thing while playing a good defensive shortstop as well. It's just, it's just a sneaky good team. Snakes alive. Snakes alive. Um, a couple of more points on the D backs offense. Dimebacks had more stolen bases in the seventh inning than they had in games one through five. That was from Jeff Passan. They need to run more. They're a team that is built on speed and defense. And when you take out the speed component, but it's funny, they're in game seven against the Phillies. So like, fuck it. But it's it's really hard against JT. I'm also going to give him that. JT Absolutely. consistently like top five pop time in baseball. Just being more aggressive, I guess. Just putting it in the back of their mind. Like Corbin Carroll's just not going. Stole 54 bags. Like in the in a regular season Phillies game, pretty sure you'd try against JT Romuto, right? But in the postseason, he seems apprehensive. It's a postseason. Like, you just don't want to relinquish base. I, I don't know. It's it's a tough one, and that's why we're not managing. That's why we're not managing. Um, Yeah, just again, I, I wrote down a bunch of points where I just saw middle-middle fastballs from Nola, and the D-backs were just doing damage. Nola wasn't nearly as precise as he normally is. This guy lives on the corners with six different pitches. And when he's middle, he's very hittable. And the Diamondbacks just jumped all over him. This game didn't really have a lot of, you know, crazy highlights. The Diamondbacks took an early 3-0 lead. The Phillies got one back. There was one run scored in the fifth by the D-backs, one in the seventh. And that was it. 5-1 win. What we will say is, again, Kyle Schwarber 0 for 2. Had a couple of walks, though, but 0 for 2. Trey Turner 0 for 4. Now, Turner has been excellent. Right, he's rocking an 1,100 OPS this postseason, so, and he almost hit a home run in that first AB, but he did go 0 for 4. Bryce Harper 0 for 3. And he's been quietly slowing down a little bit ever since they left the bank. Now, Bohm finally had a couple of hits, 2 for 4, so that's a bright spot. Bryson Stott 1 for 4. J2 Romuto, one for four, Castellanos, Ofer. And then I also wrote down Brandon Marsh is the only Phillies hitter who wants it. He Two. really wants it. Like helmet off before the tag was applied to him at second base. He wants it bad. Two for four day from him. He's hitting 350 in these playoffs. And unfortunately, Yohan Roas is an auto out. Now he's playing incredible defense in center field. I don't think the Phillies care what he does offensively. It's kind of like with the Ashos and Martin Maldonado. As long as you play your position, we're fine. But the reality is he has a 283 OPS. And it yeah. does stink when your nine hitter is an auto out. Compare that to the D-backs. Geraldo Perdomo is anything but an automatic out. He's been one of their best hitters, lengthens the lineup. But if you can get past Marsh, you kind of have an auto out, and then you go to Schwarber. Think about the team that won on the American League side. Which nine hitter was objectively way better? Leody Tavares would hit like fifth for the Phillies. Yeah. Eh, I mean, Bohm's hitting cleanup, but Castellanos is hitting seventh. It's just, it's it's interesting lineup construction, so he'd probably hit leadoff or ninth. <laughs> he, he, he might, but what I am saying is, Leody Tavares in this postseason right now has a Leody Tavares has a 744 OPS, and that's going 0 for 5 in his last game. That's 744 OPS on the Phillies right now. Like sixth. Yeah, would rank below Marsh, Castellanos, Harper, Real Muto, Harper, Turner, Schwarber. So be the seventh best hitter on the. There we go. I took a lot of time to just make a nothing point. It's okay. It's okay. You know, it's late. It's twelve thirty-five. Twelve thirty-five predictions. 
I just had a couple of points, more points. Sal Frank, I think he's really good. <laughs> I just, that's what I wrote down. I, I wrote down Sal Frank is so good and I really don't understand it. 92 mile an hour sinker with an 84 mile an hour curveball. Very limited time in the regular season. And now he steps up as this like, like when he comes in, you know, just that feeling you get when a reliever comes in where you feel good kind of against whoever. Yeah. I have that feeling about Sal Frank and I don't know why posted a 72% ground ball rate in like a couple of innings in the regular season. Now he's coming in. He's the seventh inning guy and he's shoving. And I'm like, yeah, I believe in this. I don't know why, but it's a hard sinker and guys just hit it straight into the ground. If it works, it works. This diamond in the rough guy. If it works, it works. 26 year old from Fort Wayne went to IU. Um, He was like a great reliever because he didn't allow fly balls in the two most hitter friendly environments, maybe in professional baseball in Amarillo in Reno, this guy, 33 and a third innings in Amarillo, 23 hits. He had a two seventy RA. I know as a reliever, but like you have to understand Amarillo, maybe the most hitter friendly environment in minor league baseball. It's zero gravity there. Like when you see a 500 foot Homer in the minor leagues, chances are it came at Hodgetown the home of the sod poodles. And this guy was a sub three reliever in Amarillo. So those ground balls, they'll be around forever. Shout out to Saul Frank. Um, Speaking speaking about homes, Citizens Bank will host its first game seven in its 140 year history. Brandon fought toes the rubber against Ranger Suarez to win it all. Jack McMullen. Let's make a prediction. Who you got? Yes. Um, so Citizens Bank Park. I do want to clarify something because there was a very famous ballpark in Philly that I'm blanking on right now. It opened in 2004, but the Philadelphia A's played somewhere like, I don't know. It's one of those. I, it's probably one of those like classic MLB, the show stadiums that you can hit on. It was in Rome at the Coliseum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, not Athens. It was Rome. You know what I mean? Got you. No, it, no, Rome. That's I'm where the Coliseum I, I, I'm is. I'm not I'm a wordsmith. You. I'm a ball knower. No, but like you are a wordsmith too. You're a geography you. knower. Um, but those are the two options, either Athens or Rome, if you're going to go that that far back. Um, okay. Okay. I'm serious now. Game seven. At Citizens Bank Park. It's an 8 p.m. first pitch on the East Coast. It's going to be dark. It's going to be a little chilly. There's going to be a ton of towels in fan hands. They're going to be whipping around like crazy. Decibel City is a real thing. That place is going to be the most electric environment you could possibly concoct for a baseball game. And they will send a guy with an ERA in the low ones in the postseason, in his career, in the mid ones, in his, in his career in the postseason, and Ranger Suarez to the hill. And that is exactly why I'm going with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Everything in my being is telling me that the Philadelphia Phillies are going to win this game. And I've been wrong all the freaking time this postseason, and I'm sick of it. And you've got Brandon Fott, who looked great in game three, but that was in Arizona. Like Brandon Fott has no business shoving in game seven on the road in the best environment in baseball. But that's why he's going to. So Diamondbacks, strictly because it goes against every ounce of my being and and what i think as a strategic baseball mind the arizona diamondbacks have something really special going on and sometimes i gotta scrap the the bullshit sometimes i gotta scrap like the baseball knowledge and just say like there's something special and there was something special that took the uh, took the rangers to the world series and i think there might just be something special that takes the diamondbacks to the world series I love that you made that prediction. And I was leaning that way in the fourth inning. Then I'm getting to the fifth. And I wrote this down on my Google Doc. And I wanted to save it for the prediction. I think when they took out Merrill Kelly, that is going to bite them in the ass in this game. I think the lack of rest from those bullpen arms, Philly seeing them two days in a row, I think it's going to be low scoring. But I wrote down, I think the Phillies advance to the World Series, winning this game three to two. I think Brandon fought deals. 
I think Ranger Suarez deals. I think this is one of those 1-1-2-1 games after five. And then the Phillies get a run or two against this Diamondbacks bullpen. And we're sitting here tomorrow saying they shouldn't have taken out Merrill Kelly. Before that happened, I thought the Diamondbacks grabbed the momentum. Getting a win like that is big at Citizens Bank Park. Tori Lovello comes out and says, we're not going to get our ass kicked going across the country. Delivered on that in that game. And I thought, Diamondbacks, they're going to roll here. They're going to keep this momentum up. And I thought that little decision might end up being the difference because I thought to myself, Brandon Fott has found it. Like, this is the Brandon Fott that we expected. I don't think he's going to get, like, he's not going in with, you know, Phillies fans screaming at him. He didn't say anything, right? So he didn't, he didn't put undue pressure on himself. He They're doesn't even have a pregame two, bullpen hell. I he promise. doesn't even have a two-syllable last name. Like, they can't go, Fott. Actually, they kind of can. That sounds kind of That's good. pretty easy, yeah. But I think he's going to be fine. I think he's going to be totally fine. I think Rangers going to be great too. And I think this game is going to be decided by a Ryan Thompson, a Kevin Ginkle, a Saul Frank, or a Seawald, one of them. And the Phillies are going to inch their way to the World Series. And then I will be taking the the Texas Rangers to beat them in the World Series. I love that we're done like citing these, you know, split matchups and all that. Like it's it's just close your eyes and what do you see and for me it's close my eyes what do i see and i'm gonna say the opposite and that's what i got going i'm still rolling with what i see i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna keep rolling with that because you know if you're gonna be wrong all the time at least go out with the punches what i will say is the picks were hot six and one in the last seven until the shit bag that i had but we'll make it back and it's all brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sports books. Use that promo code if you want to play along with. Also, get yourself some Just Baseball merch. I got the hat on. And, of course, we'll be back tomorrow to broadcast all of it. And if you enjoyed on YouTube, hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the comment button. We're up late doing these previews. Hopefully, you guys all enjoyed them. Recaps, previews, y'all know the drill. And if you'd be so kind, if you could leave a five-star review, whether that be on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, That's Jack McMullen. I'm Peter Apple. We'll be back tomorrow with that. Thank you, everybody.